All right, so continuing along here with part two of the reproductive system, the female reproductive system. So the female genitalia, the external genitalia, are the labia minora and the labia majora. So these are folds of skin that cover the openings for the urethra, which is where urine is expelled, and the vaginal organs or vaginal openings, which is where copulation is going to occur. Okay. The clitoris is a sensitive organ that develops from the same embryonic tissue that gives rise to the penis in males, and it's involved in sexual stimulation. The vagina is the uh, tube where semen is deposited during sexual intercourse, and it's also the way in which a baby is delivered during childbirth through the vagina. The internal female reproductive system has two functions, so to produce eggs and then move eggs. So eggs are produced in the ovaries, like we talked about before. And during ovulation, the egg is expelled from the ovary and enters the oviduct, or the fallopian tube, where fertilization may take place if sperm is present. From there, the eggs are transported to the uterus, where they're implanted in the uterine wall, and the embryo will grow into a developing baby. Following this development, when the fetus has, you know, um, uh, reached the end of development, the inferior portion of the uterus, called the cervix, will dilate and open, and the fetus will pass through the vagina and out into the world. Here's a very basic look at the internal structure and external structure. So from the side view here, this is the uterus, this muscular area, and the cervix is the opening down here, and then this is the vagina. Okay, here's the urethral opening. Okay, the clitoris is over up here. Okay, the labia are the external genital, genitalia, urinary bladder. Here's the ovary, okay, the oviduct, these structures are called fimbriae, and the uh, fallopian tubes. Okay, you can see a different view here, better view of the ovary to the oviduct. Okay, the uterine wall is here, and then the cervix. Okay, there's different layers to the uterine wall. There's the endometrium, myometrium, epimetrium. Okay. So when egg and sperm join together in fertilization, if they are both present, um, it's called a zygote. Okay, in species that use external fertilization, meaning the egg and sperm are uh, come together outside of the body, the gametes are released, the egg and sperm are released into the environment. In other species, the male deposits the sperm into the reproductive tracts of females, and internal uh, fertilization occurs. Okay, so again, there's trade-offs to each of these. Um, internal fertilization is generally preferred because it's much uh, more efficient to uh, fertilize internally. So there's two ways in which internal fertilization occurs. So copulation, where the males will deposit sperm directly into the female reproductive tract with the aid of a copulatory organ called the penis. Also, we see sometimes sperm packaged into something called a spermatophore, which is placed in the female reproductive tract by a male or a female. Okay, so we can see this happening as well. So why do some females lay eggs while others give birth? So in many uh, oviparous species that release their eggs into the environment, that's it. That's the last thing that they do. There's no care. Whereas birds, on the other hand, will incubate their eggs, feed their young after hatching. Um, in viviparous species, the embryo attaches to the reproductive tract of the mother and receives nutrition directly from her. In ovoviviparous species, offspring develop inside the mother's body but are nourished by a nutrient-rich yolk stored in the egg. So we talked about these terms, I believe, earlier. So here's just a basic look at the life cycle. Um, you know, humans are shown here, but mammals. So yeah, gametogenesis takes place in males and females to produce the egg and the sperm. Okay, they come together through fertilization to produce a fertilized egg or a zygote. The egg then begins to divide. Okay, it divides twice, it becomes something called a, a morula and then a blastula. Okay, and notice that eggs are kind of, or cells, excuse me, are migrating from one end to the other end and separating. Okay, that's called gastrulation. Okay, after this part, organogenesis takes place, the reduction of organs, and we start to see very early in the first trimester, starting to take shape, the embryo, and then the end of the first trimester. Okay, notice how large the head is, disproportionately at this stage. By the second trimester, starting to look even more uh, like a baby, and then the newborn uh, at the end of the process will then grow into an adult and continue this life cycle. Notice that the diploid stage dominates. Okay, we talked about very early in the semester, 
um, you know, how there's haploid diploid states in plants and, and the, the different states in which they exist, um, but we see the diploid stage dominating except for right here before fertilization. So sex hormones play a very important role in mammalian reproduction. So the male sex hormone is testosterone. Female sex hormone is estradiol, which belongs to a class of hormones that are collectively known as estrogens. Okay, testosterone is synthesized in specialized cells in the testis, and estrogen is produced in the ovaries, okay, by the cells that surround a developing egg, which form a structure called a follicle. And when that follicle breaks down, it releases a lot of hormones. So human sex hormones play a key role in the development of the reproductive tract, the maturation of the reproductive tract, and the regulation of spermatogenesis. And oogenesis is controlled by uh, testosterone, estradiol, and various other hormones as well. At puberty, that's when all of these hormones really kick in. Um, so that leads to sexual maturation. Okay, so what do we see at maturation, sexual maturation? Increased levels of testosterone in uh, young men and uh, estradiol in, uh, in young women. So specifically, you want to recognize that puberty is initiated when this hormone, GnRH, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, is released from the hypothalamus. So remember how we talked about these hormones being the releasing hormones from the hypothalamus that then trigger the pituitary gland. So GnRH being released then triggers LH, luteinizing hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone from being released from the pituitary gland. What do these then do? Then they enter the bloodstream. They send the message to the testis and the ovaries saying, okay, we got to release testosterone and estradiol. And that initiates puberty and the development of all the secondary sex characteristics that are going to come about in puberty. So increased hair in males, um, deepening of the voice in females, development of breasts, right? Uh, start of menstruation, all of those things. Okay, so here's a look at this uh, process being triggered. So here's the, the brain, the hypothalamus producing GnRH, triggering the anterior pituitary to release luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone, which is going to trigger the testis in males to enact all of the puberty features that happen in males. In females, same thing, same two hormones, but they're going to act on the ovary to release estradiol to uh, trigger all of the uh, changes that will take place in females. So one of the major changes that takes place in females is the beginning of the menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle is um, a monthly cycle, a reproductive cycle that averages about 28 days. It's different for, for different people. And what happens here is in conduction, conjunction with changes in the ovary, the uterine lining undergoes uh, thickening and regression. Okay, so essentially what happens is the uterus needs to thicken up to support a baby, and then if there's no baby there, it's going to be sloughed off and expelled, okay? And that process of be being expelled on day zero is menstruation, okay? So this process, again, occurs over 28 days. So the remainder of the menstrual cycle has two phases, so we'll look at this in detail. So in the follicular phase, which lasts about 14 days, uh, the follicle matures. So surrounding uh, each developing egg is a whole bunch of cells, and they nourish the egg, and they're called a follicle. So the primary oocyte will complete meiosis one, and ovulation occurs when the follicle is mature and releases the oocyte out into the oviduct. Okay. During the luteal phase, which lasts about 14 days, a structure called a corpus luteum forms from the ruptured follicle and later degenerates if fertilization does not occur. So when the follicle releases the, um, uh, the secondary ovocyte, what's left behind is this follicle. And it's basically like a, a, a scar, I guess you can think of it. Corpus luteum is going to break down and it's going to release a whole bunch of hormones um, and degenerate if fertilization does not occur. Okay. So... Um, a little bit easier, I think, to visualize if you see it. So here's your egg, your oocyte, and it's surrounded by these follicle cells. And notice how these follicles continue to grow and surround the egg, and here we have a mature follicle. So once the follicle is mature, it's going to burst open. It's going to send the egg into the oviduct or into the fallopian tubes. Okay? So what's left behind, this pink stuff here, is follicle, and that's called the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum is going to release hormones and uh, trigger the different stages of menstruation. And if it's left behind, it just kind of degrades into, into a scar 
um, if, if implantation does not occur. So uh, luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone are produced in the anterior pituitary gland in response to gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Progesterone is produced along with estrogens in the ovaries okay, as a result of this. Estradiol secretion surges during the follicular phase, and progesterone secretion surges during the luteal phase. Okay, so you can see here, and you can measure the different levels of the hormones and how they correspond to uh, the thickening of the endometrium. Okay, so here's what's happening with the follicles at the top. Okay, and you can see when estradiol peaks, that's when ovulation takes place. And then estradiol goes down after this point, and the corpus luteum when it degrades, it releases uh, progesterone, okay, when it's left behind. You can see that from the pituitary gland, there's also a spike in luteinizing hormone at ovulation uh, and follicle-stimulating hormone as well, okay, and these correspond with ovulation. So let's look at this uh, by days and kind of see what's happening. So days one to seven of the menstrual cycle. So remember, this day zero is menstruation when all of the endometrial lining and, and everything is sloughed off. So on day one, as the uterus is shedding much of its lining, a follicle is beginning to develop in one ovary under the influence of follicle-stimulating hormone. That makes sense, right? Follicle-stimulating hormone is going to begin to develop a follicle around the ovaries. The follicle secretes estradiol, small amounts of testosterone. While its levels are still relatively low, estradiol suppresses luteinizing secretion through negative feedback inhibition. Okay, so that's what's happening in these very early stages here. Day 8 to 14, as the follicle grows, estradiol gradually starts to increase, and you can see that happening here. Okay, follicle's growing. What's happening to estradiol? It's going up. The enlarged follicle produces large quantities of estradiol, which begin to exert positive feedback on luteinizing hormone. So now we're seeing luteinizing hormone increase, spike. Okay? This surge of luteinizing hormone is going to trigger ovulation, which is happening right here. So this positive feedback that's taking place with luteinizing hormone and estradiol is going to cause the uh, egg to be released, ovulation. So now at this point here, this is when the egg is in the fallopian tube after ovulation. You find that other picture. And this is when pregnancy can take place. So the only time pregnancy can take place is if, or fertilization should take, take place, is if the egg is in the fallopian tube. That's just a very small window of time. As the corpus luteum develops from the remains of the ruptured follicle, it secretes large amounts of progesterone. So the corpus luteum that's left behind secretes progesterone in response to luteinizing hormone spike. The rise in progesterone lowers the production of luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone and activates the production of a thickened lining of the uterus. So what that does is it thickens up and creates this spongy tissue with lots of blood preparing for implantation. So let's say fertilization does not occur, okay? Um, if there's no sperm in the um, fallopian tube, which 99% of the time there isn't, the corpus luteum is going to degenerate. It's going to break down, and progesterone levels are going to fall. So when progesterone levels decline, what happens? We lose that lining of the uterus, causing menstrual bleeding at the end of the cycle. Okay. Uh, GnRH, LH, and uh, FSH are released from their control, their feedback control that progesterone exerts, and those levels rise, and that triggers a new menstrual cycle to begin. Okay, and this happens every single month. Pretty amazing. If there's no uh, fertilization that takes place, we see that happening. So you can look at these levels of progesterone and estrogen and essentially figure out where you are in the cycle, where females are in the cycle, and that can be a way of looking at uh, preventing pregnancy, contraception. So hormone-based birth control delivers synthetic versions of progesterone um, or progesterone and estradiol. And these hormones are going to suppress the release of GnRH, FSH, and LH through negative feedback and therefore are going to prevent ovulation from taking place. The best or the most common way in which this is done is through uh, contraceptive pills. Okay, so these are taken for three weeks and then stop for a week to allow for menstruation. 
There's other ways in which you can get the hormone levels. So there's patches, implants, um, all kinds of things. There's a ring that prevent pregnancy by preventing ovulation. Okay, there's other birth control methods that uh, include preventing sperm from contacting the oocyte, right, through barrier methods, um, condoms, things like that. When sperm and egg do unite, then the menstrual cycle is interrupted, okay? So the corpus luteum does not degenerate. So what does that mean? That means that the levels of progesterone and estradiol are going to stay high, okay, because that corpus luteum degenerating was, was bringing them down. So that means that the woman is pregnant. She's going to keep that thick endometrium lining and support the developing baby. Okay, so here's some different methods of birth control for your reading pleasure. Um, so there's different barrier methods. Most common is the condom. It's the most effective, easiest to use, but there's other ones as well. There's a female condom. There's a diaphragm, which is similar to the female condom. Sponge, uh, spermicide, which is a gel that prevents sperm from entering the uterus. Again, you can see the percentage effectiveness there. Um, the most effective non-barrier methods would be uh, the hormone-based methods, the pills, the pill and the patch. Okay, um, rhythm method, couple <laughs> refrains from intercourse, so monitoring your cycle, and there's different sort of things you can look at for that. You can The female can take her temperature, and that corresponds usually with the different uh, changes that take place in hormone levels. Uh, the withdrawal method, the man withdraws the penis before ejaculation, 73% effectiveness, which I guess if it's 73% effective, you're not doing it right. Shouldn't be 100% effective if you do it right. Um, <laughs> pregnancy termination, that's the abortion pill. Um, IUD, inner uterine device, okay, is going to, um, in some cases, secrete hormones, uh, but basically induces the uterus to produce substances hostile to sperm and eggs. So um, having that in there elicits an immune response, uh, the IUD, so that it's you know, getting the uh, sperm before it gets to the eggs. All right, so that will wrap up this chapter. I will see you next time.